Wow. I've, I'm a bit nervous now. I don't normally get nervous about these things. Um, but when, when you wait for coffee, it's like every second. So I have been to the loo about five times, but I've taken five selfies. Uh, so all the girls in the room, anybody who's not been here before, the tradition at Picture House uh, is you go into the toilet and take a Picture House <laughs> selfie, tag yourself. Um, I think, where's he gone? I think there is an account as well. Um, so let's fill the timeline with pictures of ourselves in the toilet. <laughs> That's the end of my speech. So when, so when Penny asked me to, to do this talk ages and ages ago, um, I immediately said yes and then thought, ah, Oh, the other thing is, I'm gonna, I think I can project, if you can't hear me, we've got a mic, so put your hands up if I'm too quiet. It's not normally something I get accused of. Um, are you all right? Can you hear me? Pete all, Pete's on it. Uh, yeah, so when she asked me, I kind of thought, pioneer, uh, not me, that's not me, I can't do that. And then I pondered a bit, so I said yes anyway, because I usually do. Um, and then pondered, and I, thought, and I thought about what Pioneer means to me, and I did the classic thing that anybody who gives any talk does, which is you go and Google it. Um, and I got all these defini definitions of Pioneer that just made me think, no, that's even not me. Uh, so it said words like inspira inspirational and groundbreaking and all of those things. And, and I thought a bit more, actually, about what, what do I think of when I think of Pioneer. And the things I think of are um, the people who colonised the west of America, so the, the, um, the settlers who then looked out across the prairies, and if they'd looked closer they might have seen the native people, but they didn't, they just saw wide open spaces and went for it. And I think of people who stand on earth and look up to space and think, what's up there, I want to go up there. Um, and I thought, so maybe, so my conclusion when I thought of all of that stuff was maybe pioneering is something about moving out of the settled spaces, so the the conurbations or the homes or the things that are settled and known and moving somewhere else. Um, and then I thought, yeah, do you know what? I can do that, I can own that. I can talk about the things that have been settled for me and how I've moved beyond them. Um, and I'll preface it by saying, this isn't a lesson, it's not a parable, it's stuff that happened to me and some conclusions that I've drawn. I do a load of teaching at Sheffield Hallam um, and up at the University of Sheffield. And I always say to people, you know, it's a poor thing, but it's my, my own, and just draw your own conclusions. So I'll offer, it, off, offer this in the same spirit. Draw, draw your own conclusions from, um, from the things that I've done and the stuff I learned along the way. So my settled place, I thought that's a good place to start. How did I get, where was it, and how did I get beyond it? Um, and I'm really conscious that I'm being filmed talking about this, and it'll go online, and my dad will watch it, and, you know, people who know me will watch it. So there's a kind of limit uh, to how, well, I'll be open, but there's a limit to how much of the horror I will tell you about. Um, so I was brought up in Rotherham, and some of you might have heard some of this story, and apologies if you have, um, but I was brought up in Rotherham, it's a dump. Uh, there's kids in the room, so I won't say what I really think about it. Uh, and in the 70s, it was a pretty grim place to be. And in the 70s, if you're mixed race, it was a really, really grim place to be. And in the 70s, if you were mixed race and thought you liked boys but probably thought you liked girls as well that was kind of really like a double whammy um so rotherham was pretty pretty crappy really and i was brought up by um by an indian dad and a, a welsh mother and and taught and I, I kind of think is it the times or is it the 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 culture of my dad and maybe it's a combination but but whatever it was i was i was taught really effectively to be quiet and good um, and I'm a really, really quick learner and very, I'm not very obedient these days, but I was a very quick learner and knew how to get along. So um, people would say things to me like, well, you could pass as Italian, it's fine. These people used to say stuff like this in the 70s. Don't worry about your Indian name because people could think you're Italian or Spanish. And I used to go, yeah, so, yeah, so maybe I'll rock that kind of Mediterranean thing. And I did it and I passed. We used to call it passing, passing for white. Um, and I'd suppress the stuff about really quite liking girls. Um, and just liked boys, kind of publicly, um, and that was fine. I passed for that, and I did what was needed of me. Uh, so I excelled at school, which was expected of me, and right up until I was 19, I was going to be the 11th generation of doctors. I, all the money was on me. I was the one that was going to fulfil that promise uh, because my dad was the 10th generation, uh, until I freaked out at A-level stage. So I did all sciences, even though in my heart I 
I knew there was a tiny spark of creativity. Um, and it sounds like a sad, sad luck story, but it isn't really because, you know, I was privileged, middle class, had all the kind of stuff that, that middle class kids have. Um, but there was this voice in me that up until I was 11 wrote poetry and won a couple of little prizes for it. And um, that used to dabble in doing things that used to dance freely, that used to um, be out in the world making stuff. I mean, I'm not an art, a visual artist in any sense. And from 11, I, I learned my lesson so well that all of that, I don't think it went, but it was just, in, it was just deep inside of me. Um, so superficially, I was a scientist. I was heading for medical school. Um, and then I decided I wasn't. That was it. And the, the, all, there was all hell to pay. Um, and I've never spoken publicly about this, but it was really, really traumatic for someone so obedient and good, good, uh, to say no. And it was the first time in my life I never said no. So that was my first frontier of saying, actually, my settled place where I'm meant to be is not what I'm going to do. Um, and, and I paid the price of that in lots of different ways, uh, mainly in my mental health. So by the time I got to uni, I went up to Durham, uh, which, you know, was, was great. I suffered terribly with really poor mental health. Um, again, in the 70s, you didn't talk about that stuff. Uh, so I struggled on, probably other people were struggling around me, but nobody ever talked about it. Um, I did, I had waist length Indian hair until I was 19. It was beautiful. It was all long because that's, I wasn't allowed to cut my hair. So of course, the first thing I did when I went to college was shave it all off. Um, and there's a few little pictures of that. And so, so I got to college still quite obedient, very, very smart um, in the sense of hardworking and where I wasn't naturally intelligent, just kind of um, book learning it really. And then started to develop this secret life, which was about going out and having fun, um, learning to DJ, running club, little clubs with my mates, uh, the famous one being Plan B, which was our, our club in this tiny little nightclub called Clute. Um, so there was a kind of duality started to happen for me um, because this quiet little voice inside me just couldn't be suppressed. This is all with hindsight. At the time, I had no idea any of this was going on. It was just kind of how it was. Um, and then through a kind of set of circumstances, I turned up in Sheffield and the double life got even more more split so so what happened then was I stopped DJing because I'd done it at college and really liked it and then when I got to Sheffield it was very 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 cool in the 80s um, and I just got terrified so I saw all these boys doing things and just thought I'm too scared to do it so that frontier never got never got crossed it never in my life got crossed somebody needs to teach me how to DJ so I can cross that one I'll throw the gauntlet I'm looking at Charlie I'll throw the gauntlet down uh, so someone can teach me to do that so I, so I knew I couldn't DJ because I told myself I couldn't, but what I could do was be out there clubbing. So, and, and in a way, it's kind of why I've chosen this place because it, it's, this is one of my favourite places in Sheffield and anybody who sees me out knows that I'm, I'm a nutcase when I'm out. I really enjoy myself. I really enjoy dancing. I really enjoy partying. I love talking to people and having daft conversations out, having a, you know, catching fags off people and um, just being an idiot really and enjoying it. And, and so I started to do that really, really big style. I really got into club culture. Um, I, I just, and in the 80s, that was a massive cry of resistance against Thatcher. Um, and for anybody, I'm looking kind of who's old in this room, who's out. Yeah, I know, there's a few of us. So people of my age, so I'm, eight, I'm 55. I nearly said 85. I'm 55. I'm 85, you know. Um, <laughs> I'm 55, so anybody of that generation will know it was great. You know, it was the tail end of the 70s. It was drab. The clothes were horrible. Um, uh, you know, the things that were available for us to do. So what we did was develop a, a really strong counterculture. So we created all our own um, our own fun, really, and that was a great big two fingers up to Thatcher and and the stuff that was going on. Uh, you know, to unemployment and to. Uh, life being very grey and we created this great big colourful outpouring of creativity and my and the only creative thing I did was to dance and make a vibe so looking back now I go yeah I was part of that I made the vibe um, so anybody who ever looked at the Sheffield girl stuff I did a couple of years ago that's what that was about it was saying you don't tell my story without me in it um, at the time it, it just seemed like something that I couldn't live without I danced for three or four times a week every night up until two everything shut at two so you couldn't stay out any later than that um, meanwhile my career was going stratospheric because I was still very good and very obedient and very smart and a quick learner um, and so I started getting these jobs I went off to London uh, for a job 
and kind of zigzagged until I got really high up. Meanwhile, being this kind of, uh, back in the day, we used to say weekend ravers, so people who were, uh, you know, working hard in the week and then going crazy at the weekend. Um, and I, I guess I was one of those. So, so I was in a settled place. I was in a settled place where that was safe, it was comfortable, it was known. Um, I, did, I wasn't really challenging myself and I was still doing what I was expected to do um, until, so that proceeded, and this is where I was a very, very slow learner. Um, so I was on a kind of trajectory to, uh, to a breakdown, I think, because the two bits in me were, were kind of going so far apart, they were pulling me in two, uh, until I had my son, who's now 18, and I kind of cleaned my act up because when, when you have a kid, you look after your body and you nurture this thing inside of you. And suddenly I started to look after myself. It was the very first time probably that I'd consciously done that. Um, so I cleaned up my act, uh, something that I'm not prepared to share on film, but something really bad happened that was my fault. Um, and I behaved really badly and I had to run away back up to Sheffield. Uh, so I came back home, lived in Rotherham for a little bit and then came back. Um, and then settled down. So I started just being a mom and I got a very, very senior job at the council. Um, I started to earn loads and, you know, relatively lots and lots of money uh, for the job that I did. Had huge teams, lots of, you know, two million pound budget. And there was still this kind of, um, this, I don't even know what to call it, this kind of split between the little silent creative me inside and, and the kind of person that di that looked after everybody that was at work looking after everybody that didn't have a voice that um just did what i thought everybody wanted me to do which was make stuff happen really well and i was i still am brilliant at that but now i can't be bothered to do it um but i can do it so i'm really good at that and and so so meanwhile so then i'm going well i quite like this club stuff uh you know the kids I can leave the kids with a babysitter so then I discover raving in Sheffield again like coming back to its second wave so this is this is good um I look at Peter there who was kind of responsible for some of my happiest nights on the dance floor and so I started to do things like um to do the door and at a night uh, a kind of uh I want to say illegal rave at an illegal rave um which would then became legal she said for the lawyers for the camera um <laughs> So it's highly legal now. So I started to do that kind of stuff and just get myself back out there. And at this point, because by then I was in my 40s, would you believe it, I started thinking, actually, this, this is not sustainable. Um, after I had my beautiful daughter who's sitting over there, uh, I had absolutely cataclysmic postnatal depression. And luckily for me, I wouldn't be standing here if this hadn't happened. I got... Um, I got sent to psychoanalytic psychotherapy, which is basically Freudian stuff where you lie down on a couch. How they decided that was the thing for me, I'm, I was too ill to understand really why that happened, um, but it was the making of me. So I had twice a week for six months, um, which really helped. Then my mother died very suddenly of leukemia, uh, which just kind of uh, just rocked my world back on its heels. And at that point I thought something has to change. So, so my frontier, my settled place, I just, I didn't think of it in those terms, but I knew something had to go. Um, and so I started to try and, and have a voice really tentatively. And I started to put on events and I started to run markets and I started to dabble in being more creative. Meanwhile, at the council, the, uh, you know, the government had changed, austerity had started to kick in. So there's me with my two million pound budget. So when somebody tells you that you've got to cut 30%, I used to be able to do the maths, I can't now. Um, Bit, that's a lot of money. When they tell you the next year, yeah, that was good, you got 30%, can you do me another 15? That would hurt. And then the final year, when I'd cut 60% in total of the budget, it hurt like hell because I was making people redundant. Every day, people were begging for their jobs. I wasn't sleeping. It was awful. I was out clubbing, doing, doing stuff that made me feel good and running these markets and just doing creative things. Um, and meanwhile, in this job where every value I held dear just was being trampled underground. Um, and it got to the point in December 2012 where I, couldn't, I just couldn't hack it anymore. And I came home to, to Matt one day and just said, uh, you know, I'd done some coaching and I just said, I, I just can't do it. And he said, well, then you need to leave. Um, and we'd been thinking about it for a few years and we couldn't afford it. And we still couldn't afford it, but I did it because it was making me ill. So the other thing, the other frontier that was crossed, so that was the big leap into the unknown. So imagine the person looking across the prairie and not seeing anything there. That was me look, standing on the threshold of the town hall going, well, what the hell am I going to do now? Uh, 
like seriously. And so December I left, January I set up in business. And what had been happening to me just for about a, prior, a year prior was I'd discovered this thing called coaching, which I knew nothing about, zero, um, until I was given a coach on a leadership program. And um, it, she just changed my world in three sessions. It's just like, this is amazing. So the things had been coming together into a kind of perfect storm. And I, d I decided I was going to study coaching. So I went and did a master's. Pushed, pushed myself. I hadn't studied since 1984. Um, so by this point, I was about 49. No, I was 50 when I left the council. So I went back to college, um, started studying at Harlem, and I now teach on that course, which is amazing. And coaching became my huge passion. So now I've got this tiny creative voice kind of letting itself out. And this thing that I love called coaching, where you work with people and you sorry it's a horrible term but you hold space you you sit and listen and pay attention and they tell you their stories and then I remembered that my superpower had always been that I would go to parties and people would tell me shit and I'd come home and go people just tell me all that stuff Matt like what's going on and he'd go well you're just a good listener aren't you and I always make a funny voice when I talk about Matt he doesn't really talk like that he did, in fact he doesn't say much at all but um so he said yeah you're just a good listener um, and I am I'm a I'm an absolutely astounding listener. I had no idea, but I am brilliant. Um, so, so, that, so here I'm doing this thing, and I'm making some money out of it, and the clients started to come, and now I work with really cool companies like Fairshare, and you, you know, lots and lots of uh, creative people, lots of entrepreneurs in Sheffield, lots of people who want to be but aren't. And I, and I absolutely, I cannot tell you, to find a vocation that late in life is, is, is ast astonishing to me. But it was all about, and I'm, so I don't pretend to be this fabulous kind of, oh, I'm so pioneering, I just go out there and do it. It was, a, it was kind of a bit of push and pull, but I went out there and did it um, and, and just have never looked back. So my settled place changed, like I extended the boundaries of what was settled. So here I am at, at 50, 51, kind of going, well, I'm coaching, um, I, you know, doing th things around the creative scene, but not making. Uh, and I... I've probably potted on like that, I'm keeping an eye on the time, for a bit. Are we okay for time? So, so I potted on like that for a while, really happy, really, really happy. You know, the kids are kind of uh, getting into their teenage years. They needed a bit more kind of, of me around helping them because um, I'd worked very long hours up until then. And then a few, th a few things happened um, that really kind of moved me into the next phase, and that's where I am now. So in terms of past and present and future... Uh, and one thing that ha big thing that happened to me that not everybody knows about me is that I'm almost profoundly deaf um, and I would take them out but I won't be able to hear anything so so I, I went in for a kind of mid middle-aged lady kind of checkup at the doctors like you have like like we have to have and um, they said da 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 blood pressure blah 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 um, anything else and I said yeah you know I, I kind of losing the end of sentences especially when I'm working with women uh, and the doctor said, oh, well, let's get you booked in for a hearing aid check, a hearing check. And I went to the hearing aid guy and he said, do you realise you're, you've profoundly, you're profoundly deaf, you've lost most of your hearing in both ears. And I was like, what? Like, what? What? <laughs> How can that be? And, and what I realised when I, and so then I, I went to see Gideon at Boots. If anybody's got hearing problems, please go and see my friend Gideon at Boots. He's a genius. <laughs> He's an absolute genius. He's funny as well. Um, and he, he got me these uh, they're 16 track digital hearing aids. I can hear like a cyborg. I can hear, I, can, I guarantee I can hear, probably hear better now than any of you in this room. Certainly anybody who DJs or does music, I can hear better than you. Um, and what I'd been doing is lip reading and that's why I was such a great listener because I would stare intently so that I didn't miss a single thing that anybody said. And I wasn't listen, and what I learned to do was not listen to the words because I couldn't hear them. But I listened with my body. I listened with everything. I could, I could, this is going to sound a bit cosmic and mystical, but I could hear them without them saying anything. I could hear what they were saying to me, almost like their soul was talking to my soul. And that's what I brought into coaching because I couldn't hear a damn thing, really. But I thought I could because I was hearing plenty of other stuff. Um, so that was huge. And that, that really took me out of my settled place because anybody who's got a disability, especially an invisible one, you, you start thinking about what that means for who you are, how you're perceived, what you're bringing to the world, what you think about yourself. So, so I, yeah, you know, because I'm so tough by now, I know how to deal with this. Yeah, stick them in, I feel amazing. Um, two things happened that really moved me. One was, 
I finally realised that electric toothbrushes beep when they run out. Like, I, it's like, man, it's making this funny noise. What is that? It's beeping because it's run out. Okay, I didn't know that. Um, and then when Gideon had put my hearing aids in, and, I, and if anybody wears them, you know when you first get them, your brain adjusts. So you, you, they sound crackly and they make funny noises until your brain calms down. Um, and I walked out of Meadowhall Boots and kind of got on the tram. And then I got out in Sheffield. I was like, what? what's that noise? And it was birdsong. And I hadn't heard birdsong since whenever. I mean, I just couldn't... I was, and I cried. I stood there and I cried. So I, I can hear the birds. And now in the morning, so when I wake up in the morning, I can't hear them. Um, and I keep my hearing aids next to the bed so I can put them in and I can hear the birds <coughs> in the tree that they're not cutting down yet. Not yet. I'll get that in. Um, and good luck to the people in court this morning from me. So, so, hearing, so I lost my hearing. Um, or regained my hearing is probably the frontier that I crossed. And then, then last year, I got a really, really bad uh, autoimmune disease, which nobody had told me, but uh, they only just diagnosed it, which came out as rashes. So I came out in this awful red rash. Um, and I'd been quite kind of pretty before then. Suddenly my skin's awful and still very marked. And then my hair started falling out. So I've got this thing. Um, and anybody who was around me at that time will know that it, that it was a bad, dark time. Anybody who follows me on social media, I apologise because it really helped me to put that out there, um, but it probably didn't help you to read it. And, and so what it did for me is, somebody said to me, when stuff happens to your appearance, it's very confronting. And I thought, yeah, yeah, actually, it's really confronting because it makes you think, like, you know, I'd been pretty, I'd been... Um, you kind of go in and charm people because you're all cute and everything. Suddenly I wasn't cute and suddenly I couldn't do that. And so that was weird and was I relying on my appearance what happened when it had gone you know the huge frontier to cross um, and so in that sense I went from a settled place of knowing what I looked like to looking in the mirror and thinking I've I don't know who you are and my hair will go um, and won't come back so I've got a whole new frontier about head the wonderful world of headwear so next time you see me it might be pink or I don't know it might be a Marie Antoinette or something uh, so I'll cross that that frontier when I get to it and then the final frontier, the big one, is age. So, so 55 is, is new and different and fabulous. And I don't give a monk, like I don't give a shit. I just honestly could not care less. So, so, so there are some consolations of age. Um, and you young people are looking at me with horror, like that couldn't possibly be true because you're never going to get old. But, it's so, but by the time you get old, you don't care because it's so cool, you don't mind. Um, so I'm embracing it because I am now free of caring what people think. I am free of having to do the thing that everybody expects me to do. I am free um, to live without judgment. I am my own judgment, which was the worst. I am um, free to not care about being on the pull or whether people fancy me, or all of that stuff that everybody bothers about all the time, even if they're in a nice, happy relationship, because we're driven like that. Uh, so I'm free of all of that. And I'm just naughty, and I just do whatever I damn well want to do whenever I want to do it, and it feels epic. So let me tell you, don't be scared of it, because by the time you get there, you'll really, really enjoy it. And that's my frontier. That's my, um, OK, what comes next? Post 55, what the hell? Let's, let's invent some new stuff. Um, and so, so that's where I am now. And then the, the kind of new thing, so the kind of new thing, the tiny little thing that I decided to challenge myself was, with last year was that I'd started a PhD. Um, so my PhD, which I'm happy to obsess about to anybody, uh, but I won't do it from the floor because it's a bit dull, is um, to obsess, the subject isn't dull is to look at what happens in the space where coaching meets art. Because I was doing so much, I am doing so much coaching with creative people and with artists. And something different happens when I meet them than when I meet other people. And I want to explore what happens to that. And, as, and I've got loads of questions about that because I think it's about questions and how artists ask the world questions and then, and then think about the answers that come back. And I think that's what coaches do um, if they're doing it like I do it, which they don't all. Um, so that's so the PhD research is the big frontier that I'm crossing. It's the big pioneer because that is my wide open space where I just look up and I go, I have no idea what's out there, but I'm going, I'm coming up to find out. And as part of that, because I think coaches could be artists with energy and vibe and with people, 
Um, so that's my kind of idea. And as part of that, I'm going to make art. Oh, and um, I won't say her name because she's too shy, but my girl gang collaborators are my absolute sisters in this. So my sister pioneers in supporting me, in egging me on, in encouraging me and being my biggest cheerleaders as I tentatively, I'm not going across in a horse-drawn cart yet, I'm just kind of tiptoeing um, in, into actually starting to be creative. So that little kid that had the little whisper of being creative is now, I think her voice is coming out. And so what, if, you, if any of you do follow me on Insta, I've been doing a project for the last year just for fun, which has been reading a poem every day because when I was 11, poetry was everything. I just loved it to pieces and I had loads of books and read loads of things. Uh, there was no internet then, obviously, so, so my access was limited. But everything that was in the library in Rotherham, I read uh, until I was told that, you know, there, is no, there are no jobs that involve poetry, so forget about it. Uh, you're going to be a doctor. And so what happened to me this year is I started to read a poem a day and just was transformed by that practi practice, she said fancifully, but by that habit of reading a poem and thinking about what it meant and looking at the shape of the words. And then the little 11 year old girl in me started to go, I want to, I want to have a go. And I was going, don't be silly, Shh, don't be silly. I was like, no, 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 I really want to have a go. And so I started having a go tiny go um normally on the bus when i've had a few drinks where i've been somewhere uh thank you sue cook for that so so they tend to be and they're all very short because i can only do it on my notes page and i don't know how to cut and paste off my notes page into insta so they're all you'll notice they only have a number of lines that you can get onto an instagram picture um but then i found out that was a thing so i'm an insta poet who knew <laughs> so that's okay that was a happy accident and so and you'll see my hands shaking. So this is my final frontier. This is me. I wrote a poem yesterday inspired by the theme of pioneer and the thought of being here with you. And I'm terrified to read this poem, which is called Pioneer. Let me have a big glass of water because my mouth's suddenly gone really dry. <laughs> I read it to my daughter. She likes it, so that's okay. <coughs> so Pioneer, inspired by the picture house and with thanks to the picture house. Pioneer. I believe in people. I believe in the things that we do together and I believe in the mistakes that we make and the things that we learn along the way. I believe in the hand on the shoulder when someone is sad, the touch that says, we aren't alone in this. I know it hurts, but trust me. I believe in house music, in dancing until your feet hurt and you can't dance anymore, so you just sit it out and listen. I believe in smiling at a stranger across a dance floor because the party is just so great. And I really believe in the way you feel when the beat drops and the room goes crazy. I passionately believe in the power of girls to change the world. I believe that children are the future and I'm sorry that we made it so hard for you. I believe that happiness comes from understanding who you are and not minding that. From self-acceptance, from compassion and from kindness and from giving more than you can afford to. I believe in mistakes and mess and lives fully lived, not perfectly lived. I believe in stories and poetry and mystery. I believe that a frontier is just the gap between what you understand now and the questions you have about what comes next. I believe a pioneer is someone who looks out into space and says, what if? Who sees the water and who jumps in, who fills the blank page just because they can. I believe in people, I believe in me, and I believe in all of you without condition. I believe we are all pioneers. Thank you. Thank you. I'll go and hide now. Are you all right for questions? Yeah, yeah, I'm just shy. <laughs> well, I wanted to just give you a Oh, hug. thank you. Oh, oh thank let you. Let me cry. Um, questions? Anyone? Or are we all crying? <laughs> no, we all cry. I'm crying. Can we go out tonight? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's, all, let's just stay here, everybody. <laughs> Drinks on me. Anybody got any questions? I'll, please go. Um, can you tell us a bit more about um, coaching with creatives and, or, and artists and how that works and what you're sort of... Yeah, so uh, anything in particular? 
Yeah, it, um, so what I noticed, I, did, uh, I was invited down to a, a scheme in the, in the Midlands a couple of years ago to be their business uh, coach. So there's a, um, a program uh, called Real Creative Futures where they, they give creative businesses free coaching and other stuff as well. Uh, so they invited me down to be their business coach. And so I got a chance to, create, uh, to coach loads and loads and loads of different people. And what I noticed was, so where people had got a, a product, like a workshop or a, you know, um, they were making something, it, it was easier to coach them in the way that program wanted. So you could say, you know, coach them around how you set up a website or, um, you know, how you uh, do your pricing, that kind of stuff. So that was a very particular kind of, what's your goal? Let's, let's get you towards it, which is a kind of traditional business coaching model. Um, and, and what I noticed with the people on the program who were poets or performance artists or uh, fine artists and conceptual artists, it's really, it's really hard to do that kind of, um, so what's your goal? And they'd be like, well, to, be a, you know, to, to do what's in my heart and in my soul and creatively to do what I want. And so there was a different sort of conversation happening there. Uh, so that's what the PhD is looking at, like, what, what is that? Um, but even, even people who've got products and stuff, there's just something different about creatives, and I, and I guarantee any of you in this room who, who uh, define yourself in that way, and, you know, and I'm emerging, just starting to call myself creative, we bring a different set of things because we get, things, we get told things like, you couldn't make a living out of poetry, you've got to go and be a doctor, or uh, you know, that's great as a hobby, music is fam fabulous as a hobby, but you want to be concentrating on your A-levels, like I tried to tell my son until I caught myself. So, so that's, you know, so that's so coaching creative that I think it's about that. It's how do we, uh, so for me, the, the research isn't about, because what that program was trying to do was change the creatives to fit in with a model. And what the PhD is looking at is how do we as coaches change so that we can meet creatives and honour what they're about, what we're about. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Finding that I'm now being sold retro stuff that I thought was. Yeah. Well, I've, 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 yeah, I know exactly, I know precisely, I mean, anybody who was around there knows exactly what that is. I, I've got a couple of um, observations, really. One is that people are coming back with stuff from the 80s that wasn't even that cool then. Yeah. Like, you know, so the cool, it's like, nobody liked Duran Duran. They, we all just sneered at them. You know, and it's the same with rave culture. So those tunes that have kind of made it through aren't the ones that were massive on the dance floor, in my experience, or not necessarily. Um, so, I, yeah, I, can, I don't object because, I, you know, stuff gets commodified and then you react with it or not as you want to, don't you? But um, I, I, I object to people being sold substandard stuff. And I also object, I really strongly object, to the stories being told that don't... Um, don't represent the people who were there. So the story of black people in rave, the story of women in rave, you know, in any club culture, those, those things incense me, even though I was just a punter. That really, really angers me. That's why I, I did this project a couple of years ago um, to try and tell some of those stories. So I, so I really object to that, the way it's sanitised and, um, and excludes people, delib I think deliberately, you know, so that, for what it's worth, that's what I think. <laughs> Oh, killer question. You should do coaching. Um, I think, what would I tell her? I would say, it's okay. It's okay. And I'd tell her to be brave. Um, and I would tell her to not stop writing because it's really hard to start again 44 years later. Uh, so, yeah, I'd probably hold her hand and just tell her it's okay. Because that 11-year-old felt very lonely and scared. Um, so I'd probably just be a big sister to her and look after her. Very deep, thank you. But I would, I genuinely would, that's what I do. I'm not, go on, ask me something. And otherwise, I think then it's just a case of, well, thank you very much, because I think it was just quite intense. It was like really lovely to listen to. I just Good. kind of like leaving it there. So. All right, um, thank you very much. One last round of applause. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Thank you.